Hi guys, it's Professor Fernandez. I'm here to do this week's lecture, which is on Harvey Milk's The Hope Speech. I'm really excited to share this with you. It's our, our third piece for this semester. Our first piece was an MLK piece as it should be since this, this course uses his work as kind of the background or the backbone. We read Amanda um, Amanda Gorman's piece, of which I didn't do a lecture on. That was on your own, but we will be returning to that piece when we're talking more about poetry. Um, for relevance and timeliness, I thought it would be interesting to read her piece first. Um, and why not? So now we're going to do our, our third piece, which is The Hope Speech by Harvey Milk. It is an essay. Well, it is a speech, actually. It was spoken, um, but what we have here is an essay. It's an abridged essay, essentially, or an edited version of this speech. Um, it is really exciting. This is my first time teaching a Harvey Milk speech. So, of course, I did my due diligence and I did my annotations. Um, so when we're talking about annotations, and if you don't know what they are, it's perfectly fine. Let me explain that to you. Doing an annotation means that you're going to read it with a pencil or a pen in hand or a highlighter or pen and highlighter, doesn't matter. And you are going to make notes in the margins. You may have heard um, annotations being called marginalia um, because you're using the margins to make notes. And some of the notes that you're gonna be making are things that you notice. Uh, maybe you notice something a pattern when within the speech, maybe you're noticing that they're doing the same technique um, rhetorically or literarily, not a word, but a literary technique um, that maybe another writer has used. Maybe it reminds you of something, maybe it elicits, elicits an emotion from you. Um, because we're studying elements of argument, maybe you recognize an element of argument here. Um, maybe you're noticing a motif or a theme emerging. Um, maybe you're noticing similes and metaphors and personifications and imagery and all the nice things, right? So you mark that um, and you take notes uh, along the margins. Um, you ask questions, who is this? What, does, what is this in reference to? I need to look this up. Um, it's almost like you're having a conversation with the piece, right? And so that is what we are going to do today in today's lecture. It's going to have the same format as the King lecture and pretty much most of the lectures are going to have the same format. Um, I hope you've already watched the context to Harvey Milk and the uh, movement that I wish he was a part of. I tried very hard to find something that was definitely less than an hour. <laughs> I did, thank you TEDx. You're more than welcome to watch the Harvey Milk um, movie as well if you have access to it. You don't necessarily have to watch it, but you can because that will probably add more context to this wonderful case. So I wanna go ahead and get started. I'm gonna do a screen share, hopefully. It was a little wonky earlier. Oh, yes, I love it when technology works. Um, and we are going to annotate the hope speech. So I'm gonna use purple as, a, a, as my writing color this week because I like purple and why not? I worked very hard to use purple. <laughs> I'll tell you the story of that another day. There's a couple of things I want to hit here. Uh, I want to hit uh, elements of argument. If you don't remember the elements of argument, please go back to last week's um, last week's module. Um, because you have a quiz on that this week. Um, there are eight elements of argument. Harvey Milk does not use all eight here though, um, which is why the speech is short. <laughs> As you know, Dr. King not only uses all eight elements of argument in his speeches, um, he uses them several times. Um, one big one he uses is reasoning in his speech and Harvey Milk uses that here as well. And I'm gonna point that out. I also, I'm, I'm gonna wanna talk about tone in here. And the tone here um, 
isn't one that is sad. Um, ironically, it's hopeful, ha, huh? the hope speech, but it's also one that is rather serious, right? He he's using um he's using his tone in an interesting way. So I want to talk about that. I also want to talk about any comparisons to Dr. King. Because as I was reading it, there were tons of things that he was doing that Dr. King did. A, a lot of things that he believed that came from King. Um, so it's it's interesting from one activist to another um, how one activist stands on the shoulder of another activist. So when you're looking at these pieces and you're looking at the social justice in these pieces, you... Um, maybe that's something you want to think about how one social justice writer or activist stands on the shoulders of those who came previous and who is standing on the shoulders of that activist that you're you're standing on or 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 writing about so who is standing on the shoulders of harvey milk right now um that's for you to decide that may be an interesting question to ask um, not my research. I already did research. Ha ha ha. So um, that may be something to think about. Um, so I definitely want to talk about the comparisons to King. I also want to talk about the topic or slash theme here. If you've already done topic um, in the module, you understand that every piece that you read in this class and forever until the end of time will have more than one topic because people don't live singularly. They don't live one existence, they live several existence. If you are poor, you are probably also homeless, also probably hungry. Um, education may be an issue. Um, joblessness may be an issue. All of those are encompassed in poverty. Um, so you just don't live one reality at the same time. And it's the same with these pieces. So it's not that they're just talking about one thing, they're hitting about several things at the same time. Okay, so I'm gonna make this a little bigger because you can't really read anything. And I'm gonna start here with the title. You always start with the title whenever you're annotating. And of course, I'm going to circle hope. So I'm expecting this to be hopeful. I'm expecting this to kind of uh, call to action here. Um, it's going to, it's one of those things that I'm going to rise up onto my feet and clap is what I'm going to do. Um, and so I'm expecting that just by the title. Also, because hope, um, the idea of hope means that things have to get better. If you are hopeful into a future, that means that what you're living now isn't exactly what you were expecting. Maybe good and maybe bad, but it wasn't what you were expecting, which means you have hope for the future. So I'm expecting that this is going to address some sort something about change. And there's weird things happening on this iPad today. The technology gremlin, gremlins are not helpful. So, I mean, change is going to be a thing, right? Um, so that's what hope is. Hope and change are linked. So I also want to talk about this date here. If you, of course, if you've done the context to Harvey Milk and the Hope speech, you understand that he was assassinated. Um, Harvey Milk became was on the board of supervisors for the city of San Francisco. It's like a city council. Um, and almost a year to the day of of his uh, of his of him being voted in, um, he was assassinated. So this is five months before his assassination. Right. So this is pretty much at the end of his of his life. Um, we also have here one of the elements of arguments, which is audience. 
right? We know that he did, he did this at a parade, so we understand this is speech. We know that there was a large crowd um, because that's what happens um, at parades. And because I'm a little bit of a history nerd, don't tell Professor Barr, um, that we know that this was in City Hall, in front of City Hall. So he's got City Hall behind him. He's got a crowd of people. It's a parade. It's festive. Um, so we have a little bit of context and audience there. So that's also um, part of the elements of argument there. All right. So we have um, we have this paragraph. I'm not going to read it to you, but I love this paragraph so much. And how he is getting in, how... Uh, Harvey, Harvey, I'm not going to call him Harvey. I don't know him like that. Mr. Milk, Harvey Milk is getting into this, um, into this piece is really interesting. He's starting with a story, my friend. So he's starting with an antidote. It's not spelled that way. I'm just writing it as I, I'm thinking. Um, he's starting with an antidote, um, an antidote. Um, he is talking about a, a bigger story to get into what he's really talking about. And he's also kind of making an argument before he makes the argument. He talks here about how um, Anita Bryant, and we'll talk about who she is here in a second, um, said that the drought in California was because of gay people. <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to laugh, that's so asinine. Um, so, uh, because of gay people. And then of course, Harvey says, when I got elected, it rained. When I got sworn in, it rained and it wouldn't stop raining at all. Uh, so the only way to stop raining is to get into recall petition. So I guess it's going to keep raining in San Francisco. So what we have here is an anecdote. And Dr. King almost does this. No, he does this a couple of times, except when he does an anecdote, it's really serious. It's not funny. Um, so he's doing this comparison. Dry equals punishment. <laughs> it's the most asinine thing, I swear. Um, and then his, his election was the solution. So he's setting up this argument here with like, with his election, with the election of a gay person in office, we have solved a godly issue, right? We have solved an issue that is so big, which was the drought in California. Um, so he, it's an interesting story because later on he's talking about, you know, we need we need to get more gay people in elected offices because yes, we have friends, but people need to see who we are so that way people don't make myths about us. And so he gets into that part of the argument very early on, right here when he's talking about Anita Bryant. Let's talk about Miss Anita Bryant, because if you don't know her, she's an interesting person. She was born in Oklahoma. She's an Okie. Uh, she was a singer. Uh, she was in pageants. She was Miss Oklahoma City, I believe. Um, she is a, and I kid you not, this is a thing, an anti-gay activist. She was an anti-gay activist and actually wrote a book the year before this speech happened in 1977 about um, how gay people would be the downfall of America or something similar to that vein. Um, and so she was very well known. She was actually, she lived in Florida. So she, showed, she did not live in California. Uh, she lived in Florida. Um, interesting, interesting, um, interesting, interesting life, interesting person, um, maybe, in, maybe an interesting thing to look her up, do just a quick search on her and get a little bit more context. All right. So that's what we got going on there. Um, so in pure Harvey milk fashion. He says this wonderful thing, um, sets it up that like his election and the election of gay people 
in general has been the solution to the drought and says, all right, let's move on, <laughs> right? And so why are we here? Why are gay people here and what is happening? He does this, he sets up this context here because Dr. King, see, remember I said up here, I was gonna tell you how it, I'm comparing this to Dr. King, yeah? So Dr. King does this thing right? He is doing this backgrounding here. 1977, 1977, this happened. Da, 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 He mentions Miami because of course, Anita Bryant lives in Florida. Da, da, da. Call back. He's really good at this. So you have here, this is the same character as King. Um, in fact, if you remember, if you recall the um, the last essay or the last speech that we read from Dr. King facing the challenges of a new era, um, I said I considered it two parts or part one, part two. Part one is this is all the stuff that's happened. And then part two is literally a call to arms. And he's doing something similar here, right? This is part of the part one. This is the background. This is giving you context. And so because we have this step here where he's easing you in here with an anecdote, right? He's easing you in here with a story, almost giving you a little bit of logic, building up the ethos a little bit here. He's setting up this context. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the tactic and this is called reasoning. Remember reasoning is the order of which they're building their argument, right? So reasoning is the process. And when you're looking at reasoning, you're gonna, you want to say, all right, they set up ethos here. They set up context here, some, some more context here. Here's where they're putting an argument statement. This is, and this is the order of the reasoning and this is the order of the argument to get to this point, right? So that's what reasoning is. So we're starting to see his reasoning, right? Again, reasoning does not mean it's somebody's idea or reason to do something. Please, reasoning and persuasion when it comes to the elements of argument have different, 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 different definitions, okay? All right, so, so we all we have that, and we also have something similar here with Dr. King um, that's happening here, um, right here. Unless you have dialogue, unless you open the walls of dialogue, you can never reach, you can never reach to change people's opinion. Where have you heard that before? You have heard that from Dr. King. And he is talking, Dr. King talks about this all the time. Specifically, he did, he started talking about this or, or he talked about this in facing um, the challenge of a new era. Remember, this is early 50s. This is a young Dr. King. This is before the I Have a Dream speech. This is before um, um, on the, uh, One Day We'll Reach the Mountaintop speech. This is before all this, right? Where he's formulating this thing. So this particular line here is definitely Dr. King, his influence of Dr. King here, right? Um, which means that he... I am going to go out on a limb that he has studied Dr. King or has heard Dr. King. Dr. King died in 67, 68. He was assassinated. Um, definitely another similarity he has to Dr. King. He was also assassinated. So he was around when Dr. King was doing his work. Um, and so he was very, he as an activist was very influenced by him. Again, this is what I'm saying, what I said earlier, he stands on the shoulders of Dr. King, right? So now who's standing on his shoulders? And so it's like one, when we're looking at social justice, one activist or one social justice writer, whether it's a poet, whether it's a, whether it's um, 
a short story person, um, whether it's an SES, whether it's a memoirist, um, they stand on shoulders of activists as well. Okay. So, um, so that idea that's similar to Dr. King here um, is that idea is that you can have laws, but really it's about the dialogue and it's about heart. So law and heart. Um, so you're starting to develop a theme here as well. Theme slash topic. Uh, no, more topic than theme actually. Um, starting to have this theme um, or this topic of open dialogue of being open. It's almost like, oh, he's talking about hope. What, what? Yes. Um, and so he talks about movement here and it's civil rights movement, but it's really more like a gay, the gay rights movement. Remember this is 1978. And so they don't have LGBTQ plus yet. It's gay rights, right? Um, that comes later, my friends. All right. So let's, I hope you guys are keeping up and I hope you're able to see, hope you're able to see words on this page. All right, so he's continued to build up the reasoning here on the second paragraph on the second page. Um, he says, the major difference, and it remains a vital difference between a friend and a gay person, a friend in office and a gay person in office. Gay people have, slan have been slandered nationwide. We've been tarred and we've been brushed with the picture of pornography in Dade County. We were accused of child molestation. It's not enough anymore just to have friends represent us, no matter how good that friend may be. So you have an, so you, you're starting that next step of the reasoning, right? The before he was talking about, um, you have to have a dialogue unless you open the walls, uh, unless you have dialogue, unless you open the walls, you can never reach to change people people's opinion, right? So we went from we've got to change, we have to open up these dialogues to change people's opinions, but we also have to, we got to be out there, right? And so we're, he's adding to his reasoning. This is the next step. Um, a little bit about this paragraph here. Um, we have a little bit of repetition. Um, you see there's a major difference and it remains a vital difference between a friend and a gay person, a friend in office, a gay person in office. Gay people have been slandered nationwide. Right, so um, it's not, not so much repetition, but rhythm. You have a rhythm happening here in this first um, sentence in that paragraph. Um, it is one of the very few examples of like literary technique being used here. Dr. King was Dr. King. Dr. King was amazing. He was an amazing writing. He was an amazing um, speaker. He was just amazing. Um, Harvey Milk was amazing. Who, but Harvey Milk was not a literary person. <laughs> um, so there's not a lot of literary devices being used here. It's mostly rhetorical devices or elements of, of argument here. Um, and so he talks here about um, the Black community made up its mind a long time ago. He is now aligning the gay rights movement to the civil rights movement that actually depending on who you talk to, may have ended with Dr. King or continued on in a different way. Um, so you have here this particular line where he is building up the ethos by aligning to the civil rights movement. Right? Um, and so he's giving, he's not getting the ethos, but the gay rights movement is getting the ethos. They're getting the credibility and he, by lining up the goals of the civil rights movement to the goals of the gay rights movement. Again, this thing that we see right here about gay people, a gay person in office, this leadership thing that Dr. King was talking about in the... Um, facing the challenges of a new era. Remember that part where he was just like, 
you know, that's great and all, but we need to, we need leaders and we need to build leaders. He wasn't talking about let's just have leaders in general. He was talking about let's we need leadership within the African American community to be our leaders outside of the African American community. Harvey Milk is talking about the same thing. Lots of parallels here. Lots of parallels. We're not even halfway through. Okay. And he's also aligning the gay rights movement to other movements as well. And we haven't studied those movements and more than likely you have not studied those movements because, um, you know, it's just, it's just, it is what it is. Um, so what, it, what, what was happening almost alongside almost the exact same time as the civil rights movement was the Chicano movement. And that actually started in California um, with Cesar Chavez um, and Dolores Huerta. So we will be getting into that. I do believe we're doing uh, Gloria and Saldua in a couple of weeks. We'll be doing... Um, how to tame a wild tongue in a couple of weeks and we are going to be doing an acto as well so we'll talk about the chicano movement when it comes what you need to know for right now is you have the civil rights movement that overlaps with the chicano movement that overlaps with the gay rights movement so it's not just oh we had a turbulent 50s 60s we had a turbulent 50s 60s 70s going into the early 80s so we had a turbulent 30 years <laughs> um 50, 60, 70s, yeah, 20, 30, 40, yeah, 30-ish years um, when it comes to social justice, okay? And then the 80s were the 80s. Uh, bless your hearts, you weren't around for that, but I was. So um, so that's what we have here. Um, here's a really great line. As time has, and the time has come when the gay community must not be judged uh, by our criminals and myths. This is something that I told you about that was coming. And yes, it, it's, it's, this is a claim here. He is making a claim here. And what a claim is, is that it's, he is saying, this is what needs to be happening, right? I am making a claim that Starbursts are the best candies on the face of this earth. Don't come at me with like your other nasty candies. Starbursts are the best, right? Are the best. I'm making a claim. A claim is controversial in that it's it, it's what I believe. Other people may believe it, but not everyone believes it, which makes it uh, makes it an argument, right? And so the idea of the gay community not being judged by our criminals and our myths, and it's time for us to come out um, to everyone. Not everyone was about this. this. Is one of the reasons why he was assassinated, right? So we have that. Um, let me go back into this paragraph here. I want to say he talks about the black community um, being judged by the leaders and not by the myths of black criminals. He talks about the Spanish community not being judged by Latin criminals or myths. That's again the Chicano movement. Um, or the brown movement. Um, the Asian community must not be judged by Asian criminals or myths. The Italian community, I mean, he is lining up with everybody. He is just saying, look at all them. Like we are in this fight together. Just the juxtaposition of all those. Again, this continues his reasoning and his ethos. And you have a little bit of pathos here too, right? Just slightly from pro more likely the audience. It makes, it makes you feel some type of way a, a little bit, right? Probably gets you a little angry, gets you a little riled up a little bit. That's the goal, right? Um, we have a little bit of logic here. A gay person in office can set a tone, can command respect, not only from the larger community, but, the, but from the young people in our own community who need both examples and hope. Um, he sets this up, you know, we are these people, we are aligned for these people. They should not be, should not be judged by the worst of their community, neither should we. So we must be judged by our leaders and by those 
who are themselves gay, those who are visible for invisible, we remain in limbo, a myth, a person with no parents, no brothers, no sisters, no friends who are straight, no important positions of employment. That's such a great quote, right? Fantastic quote. Like I would put that on a pretty background and I would put it on Instagram. Like I like that quote a lot, right? And again, continuing with the reasoning because this, this quote that I just underlined has been building up since the bottom of the first page. You see how he's putting all this together, right? And so he uses a little bit of evidence. So all this is happening, but today the black community is not judged by its friends, but by its children and no offense meant to the stereotypes, but, oh, but by, um, sorry, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. But today the black community is not judged by its friends, but by its black legislators and leaders. We must give people the chance to judge us by our leaders and legislatures. And so not only has he has, he's getting, he's adding more argument and more essentially logs to the fire with reasoning. He is also um, has evidence here. So he has to claim and very shortly he's got evidence. And the evidence is well, you see how the black communities may, can be judged or should be judged by their leaders. That could that could be us, but y'all messing around. We could be awesome, but you're messing up. We can't have nice things. It's literally what he's saying in such a nice way, right? <laughs> okay, so then just like King, he gives his marching or- orders. So this is his call to action um, paragraph here. The first gay people we we elect must be strong. They must not be content to sit in the back of the bus. They must not be content to accept pendum, pen, pen, pa, padulum, padulum, sorry. Ooh, I cannot read at late at night, apparently. They must be above wheeling and dealing. They must be for the good of all of us, independent, unbought. Does that sound familiar? It should sound so familiar king said the exact same thing in the essay we just read so there's wheeling and dealing right this is king all day all day so we are seeing lots of parallels between the harvey milk hope speech and dr king's face um facing the challenges of a new era you know and it's not um and it's not a coincidence um other than the fact that i picked them but it's not a coincidence because you have two very charismatic leaders of their own movement and they're talking at a time where they're where the movements are at a crossroads they're at the beginning of something great And so maybe the thought here is when when we're looking at social justice and we're looking at the at the movement of a social justice, of a just of social justice being at the beginning or at the crossroads of a of a brand new day with the chat with after coming after after coming from so much challenges, them being at a crossroads and a brand new day there is always hope. Maybe that is what we need to learn from both of these pieces, that when it comes to social justice, challenges eventually end up in hope because there's always a crossroads in a brand new day. And you live up to that challenge, you live up to it, um, you live up to the past challenges, you call to action to the new ones. And that's how movements keep going and how change 
happens. Um, so I think it's in these two pieces are very interesting. It's almost like they're talking to each other. It's almost like King is talking to uh, to Milk and Milk is talking to King. Um, and it'll be interesting to see if we could find a third piece that even is even part of that conversation of what it is for a movement to be at a crossroads at the edge, at the precipice of a brand new day, and what it takes to push forward. And what Milk is saying and what King is saying, saying is we need leaderships. We need us to be in seats of power. We need to be at the table making these decisions. We need to be out there and bust the myths. We need to be out there and be judged by the best of our community, not the worst of our community. It's really fascinating. Really fascinating. Um, I hope these, the, these thoughts are giving you maybe possible ideas for your research paper. All right, all right, all right. Let's go here. And this right here, this little part here, the lack of hope and our friends can't fulfill it. Um, or I remember lack of hope. He's calling back to this theme he's he's putting here, right? He's he's not really mentioned hope. The word hope this entire time, he's kind of pussyfooted around it. He's talked about what could possibly be. He's described it. He's actually like kind of built the, he's built like the foundation, but he hasn't put the block, the, the bricks on yet. And he hasn't put the, the roof on the house yet. And that's what he's starting to do right here. He's making a call back to this theme, to this topic. Um, I'm going to say theme and not topic. I'm sorry, to this topic. We're going to talk about theme here in a minute because he's not only talking about hope as a topic, but he's talking about other things and other things that we've actually hit on here recently, but we'll get there in a second. All right. So this entire paragraph, context, reasoning, audience assumption. <laughs> he does all, all four in this thing. Um, and he actually does a little bit of pesos as well. He's making me feel all the feels at the beginning when he says, I can't forget the looks on, on faces of people who've lost hope, be they gay, be they, be they singers, be they blacks looking for an almost impossible job, be they Latins trying to explain their problems and their aspirations in a tongue that's foreign to them. I felt some kind of way as the unintended audience. I was like, oh, so you have a little bit of pathos here. So let me write what's going on here. You've got context. He's giving you some, some background here. Um, you have some reasoning because he's still building this argument about hope, right? You have some audience um, because remember the audience, this is the gay, this is the gay parade in front of city hall in 78. So, you know, He's, he's got to rally the troops, right? So this audience is going to feel some type of way and he's making this assumption uh, about the audience and assumption actually means assumption in uh, elements of argument, by the way. He's making the assumption on the audience that like they've also come through these hard times, right? Um, and so you're going to make them feel a little thing. So you've got some pathos. He's doing all the things here, right? Again, he's not very literary, but he's making an argument, right? He's not Dr. King and has the King skills of literary of literary technique, but he does have the, I have similar argument skills. All right. Um, and just here, just reading this out loud, you have Be They Gay, uh, be they seniors, be they black, um, be they Latins, you have repetition here. Um, and a four, I believe, is what it is. Right. Um, again, repetition could be repetition of sounds or repetition of words. Something like alliteration is the repetition of sounds. That specifically is the repetition of the consonant sound, usually at the beginning of a word or phrase. Anaphora is the beginning 
of it's the repetition of words, um, the same words at the beginning of a phrase. So be they, be they, be they, anaphora. Usually when you have repetition, there is rhythm that comes with it. And there is a rhythm here. Again, very few literary things he's doing here, but this is a literary thing that he's doing. Be they, be they gay, be they singers, be they blacks looking for an impossible job, be they Latins trying to explain their problems and aspirations in a tongue that's foreign to them, right? So you have one, two, three, long, five, oh, four, long. So you've got this rhythm happening here in, in those two sentences. Um, lots of wonderful things. You have another repetition situation happening here with the word hope, because now he said we're hope one time. Now he's talking about it all the time. He's all about that hope, 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 repetition. Um, there's no no rhythm, no real pattern here. He's just repeating the word hope here. Um, so he's just, it's just regular, rep regular repetition, right? And that's what we got. Oh, you also have pathos back here. Um, and let me explain this pathos here. Just reading it out. Um, and the young gay people who are coming out and hear Anita Bryant, again, talking about Ms. Bryant, on television and her story, the only thing they have to look forward to is hope. And you have to give them hope. Hope for a better world. Hope for a better tomorrow. Hope for a better place to come come to if the pressures at home are too great hope that is all we that that all will be all right without hope not only gays but the blacks the seniors the handicapped the us's and the us's will give up right okay so you have all this hope right this repetition is kind of developing a sort of order rhythm but this is where he's gearing up at the end, right? This is one of those like, now let's bring it home. And that's what he's doing here at the end. And so he's putting this rhythm out there, this repetition here, and he's making you feel, or the goal is to make the audience feel like, oh my God, we can do this. I like this callback to Anita Bryant here that he's doing, because he's the callback he kind of makes, he's giving, um, this essay a big circle he started with Anita Bryant and the whole like you know brain and whatnot so you have Anita Bryant and then at the end you have Anita Bryant it's called a callback it's a callback to that thing that I said I started off with Anita Bryant oh that's funny ha 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 and so now we bring it right back to Anita Bryant and you're and he's just saying hey remember when I said we were we were the solution I just proved that we were the solution. Mic drop, I'm awesome. So essentially that's what he's doing here. Let me finish reading the end, which is the second, the last part of this. And I hope you can see this. Um, if you can't see it, I hope you're following along with your copy of it. Because I don't know how to get rid of this. Let's just do that. I guess let's do that. I'll read it out loud for you. And if you can help elect to the central committee and other offices, more gay people, that gives a green light to all those who feel disenfranchised, a green light to move forward. It means hope to a nation that has given up because if a gay person makes it, the doors are open to everyone. So if there's a message I can give, it is that I've found one overriding thing about my personal election. It's the fact that if a gay person can be elected, it's a green light and you and you and you and you have to give people hope. Again, makes me feel some type of way. I'm just like, yes, let's give all the hope. But let's talk about his use of green light because he uses green light here three times. Um, the green light to people who feel disenfranchised, green light to move forward. And then he says, um, if if we can, if a, pay, if a gay person can be elected, it's a green light. Green light, um, if you have read um, The Great Gatsby, 
it's the same usage of green light there. It's permission. It's permission to venture forward. That's what a green light is. And, and it gives you permission to like take your foot off the brake and put it on the gas pedal and go. Preferably at the speed, at the at the at the speed limit. Don't get a ticket and say professor fernandez says i can go however i want to go stop with the lies um so um it just gives you permission to go forward and he's literally giving people permission here to hope it's beautiful ain't it um he's giving people permission to hope giving people permission to run for office to come out of the closet, to be themselves, to be part of a movement and to be seen, to be seen. That's the big thing. So when we're talking about topic, see, I'm circling it back to topic. He is talking about being seen, right? Um, whether it's out of the closet, an election or being part of the movement. He is giving them permission to be seen. So it's almost like a call to action. He also talks about here, he talks about leadership and talks about power. He talks about owning the narrative Let us be judged by the best, but not by the worst. Let us not create myths. Let them let them not create myths about us. That's what owning the narrative is. He's also, of course, talking about hope. He's also um, talking about um, reaching across other movements. He doesn't do that. Um, directly, right? He compares the gay rights movement to civil rights and to the Chicano movement. Um, and he aligns them, but he also says that like, we got to talk to people. We got to talk to people. Um, and so he's talking about reaching across movements here, having dialogue. That's what he's talking about. You see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven-ish topics just off the top of the head, just by us having a conversation. If we went to bed, woke up, had a really good breakfast and reread this um, with maybe a different color pen in our hand, we could probably find a couple more topics that we haven't touched on, right? Of course, the gay rights, right? always the topic, right? So you have all these topics. And when we talk about topics, this is what I'm talking about, right? So if you're looking for um, a research project, um, I would just pull the topics. Like how is the topics here versus topics on a Dr. King essay? Maybe not necessarily, um, the facing the challenges of a new era but another king essay look we have a whole book of king essays you can pick one right maybe another king essay maybe we have maybe there's another essayist um that's on the list um and what are they doing and so maybe you're looking at patterns and you're seeing maybe all of them are saying um we need to find our own leadership and be part of the power structure, be, having a seat at the table. What does that mean? Um, because a lot of social social justice talks about that. And so maybe that's something you wanna compare. Maybe that's something you wanna say, how does each, um, how does literature talk about access to power or access to leadership? Um, 
and how important is that to social justice movements? Ooh, how, how awesome would that topic be? Um, you can't use it because I've, I've told you, ha, ha, ha. So you have to do your own original one. Ha, ha, ha. But see how that worked? All right, I'm done talking about things. I don't want this to be terribly long because Dr. King's was long and I have this feeling that letter from Birmingham will be long as well. Um, so I'm going to make, I, I want this to be short. Thankfully, uh, Mr. Harvey Milk only had like two pages really of stuff versus Dr. King who has a million pages, but he's fantastic. So we love him. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I hope that you um, sign up for office hours. Um, a couple of you have already reached out um, and we've already had a conversation. Um, so you are on your way. Some of y'all are probably looking at me like, why did I sign up for this? You signed up for this because you're good at what you do. Because you're meant to be here. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I hope that you had um, some good insights on this. This was a really good speech. Um, when I read this uh, in anticipation of teaching this class, I wanted to teach this speech very badly. Okay. See you later. Bye-bye. <laughs>